Well, now we get a chance to see whether it works or not. Forgive me in advance if uh, I do have some struggles in um, trying to get words out. Uh, but I am thankful that I have as much voice as I do this morning. Um, when you lose it, you realize how much, you know, how valuable it is and how much you appreciate it uh, when you do have it. Well, let's, um, let's begin by reading the text this morning in John chapter 8, uh, verses 48 through 59. This is the uh, completion of that debate that is ongoing between Jesus and the Jews on the, uh, at the Feast of Booths. And really, I believe what our Lord Jesus is doing here is simply trying to communicate the gospel to those who are his, his sheep. Remember, he came to his own, those who were members of the church, those who believe themselves to be God's people, and he's, he's their Messiah. He's presenting himself to them. He wants them to receive him. Uh, I think he has a very strong desire that they would do so, and so he is willing to stand and to take the abuse that they have and to continue to preach the gospel, the words by which they might be saved. So let's read about that conclusion in John 8, verses 48 through 59. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died, the prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now again, let me just remind you, last week we saw Jesus defending uh, the two things that he said to those Jews who quote-unquote believed uh, to warn them of the danger that they were in, the danger of their situation. They said they were free. No one could tell them what to do, but Jesus says, no, you're not free. You are the slaves of sin. Uh, sin basically has command over you. Uh, you. You submit to it, you obey it, and because you do, you will receive the wages of sin, which is death. They said they were the children of Abraham, and they might have been his uh, physical descendants, but they were not his spiritual children, and of course that's what matters most of all. How could they be the, the children of Abraham, the believer, as long as they were still enslaved to sin? Now, Jesus said they needed something more. And of course, what they need is the faith of Abraham to believe as Abraham believed, to believe what Jesus was, was telling them, uh, to turn from their sin and to trust him. If they did, then they truly would be free. Then they truly would be the children of Abraham. Now this morning, we see their response. Uh, did they repent? Did they believe? Well, no, they didn't, but what they did do is what so many people do today. When you tell them the truth, they verbally abuse the messenger, 
And of course, they continue in their hatred against the Lord Jesus. And we understand that's because of the condition people come into in this world. It's not just ignorance. The Bible says they're born dead in trespass and sin. Now, our passage reminds us again that our audience, uh, the people to whom Jesus sends us to minister the gospel, have a problem. And the problem is an inborn hatred and distaste for the things we are bringing to them. Their hearts are bent away from the gospel. Uh, scripture calls them the enemies of God. It's not because God is unwilling to be reconciled with them. It's because they're unwilling to be rec reconciled with a God who has given them everything that they have and is willing to give them eternal life. But our text also reminds us that this should not stop us from trying to tell them the truth. I mean, look at what our Lord Jesus Christ did. He continued to reach out to them because this is what the Father sent him to do. And this is, this is how Jesus, of course, was expressing his love for the Father. He wanted to honor him. And the way he would honor him, of course, was by doing what it is the Father sent him to do. And he was doing this because he knew this was the only way that these people who hated him could possibly be saved. Our Lord Jesus continues to show his mercy, continues to show compassion, uh, even to those who ultimately are going to kill him. The reason why he did that, of course, was because he knew the gospel was the only way they could be saved. The Spirit of God works through the gospel. Uh, he works to save those who hate him. I mean, how is it that those who are disinclined towards God, who, who hate him, who are his enemies, how can they ever come to Christ? Well, it's only through the gospel because the Spirit works through the gospel to change the hearts of those who hear. This is how our Lord Jesus gathers his sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice. They hear his voice in the gospel and they follow him. Now, I want us just to walk our way through this text and again, see the response, how people are responding to Jesus, but to see his response toward them as he continues to preach the gospel to them and to explain it more clearly to them so that they might ultimately be saved. Now, if we first see how the Jews responded to Jesus regarding the comment Jesus made that they are the slaves of sin regarding his comments that they are not the true children of Abraham, how they responded to the truth. And their response was that of attack. They attacked Jesus. He says what well, we read in verse 48. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? You say we're not related to Abraham? Well, Jesus, you're even worse than the condition that you think we may be in. You are a half-breed. You are a Samaritan. Now remember, in the eyes of the Jews, there was almost nothing worse than a Samaritan. Uh, the Samaritans, you recall, were basically half-Jews and half-Gentiles. They came about because of the, uh, the deportation of the northern kingdom of Israel, scattered throughout the nations, and then the king of Assyria brought other people into Israel and uh, basically the Jews intermarried with them and, and came uh, with this uh, basically a, a religion that was very close to the Jewish religion, but not quite. The Jews despised the Samaritans because of their mixing with the nations and that's why the Jews would often, when they had to travel from uh, Judea into Galilee or the other way around and Samaria was in between, they would go around Samaria they would not go through Samaria, which is also remarkable why our Lord Jesus Christ, as we saw in John chapter 4, goes through Samaria and ministers to the Samaritans and reveals who he is to them. Even though his people are rejecting him, the Samaritans receive him. So, again, they call him a Samaritan, but further they said, Jesus, you are demon-possessed. What's worse than being a Samaritan? What's worse even than being a slave to sin, which Jesus was saying was true of them? Well, being a slave of Satan, being possessed by an unclean spirit, to be in a condition where you don't have control over your body, where you don't have control over your mind. Basically, they were telling Jesus, you're not only a Samaritan, Jesus, 
you're crazy, you're out of your mind. Now, again, this is how they repaid him for telling him the truth. They didn't shake his hand. They didn't tell him, well, thank you, Jesus, for telling us the truth. That's what we needed. Now we can be saved. Instead, they attacked him. And we have to ask the question, why did Jesus bother, even knowing in advance that this is the way they were going to respond? Why was Jesus willing to take this kind of abuse? Well, he did it for love. He did it out of a love for his father, of course, because this is what the father sent him to do. But he also did it out of love for them. Uh, Jesus is the embodiment of love. He's the personification of love. Again, he knew this was the only way they could be saved. And so he was willing, as it were, to stick his neck out and to take this kind of abuse, even though he knew it would culminate in his death, in order that they might be saved. And a number of them didn't, you know, didn't come to him, of course, during the, his earthly ministry. But we do see thousands repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ once Jesus had ascended and once he sent his spirit into the world. Now, when we're evangelizing, we need to ask ourselves the same question. Why should we put ourselves through so much difficulty? Why should we allow our emotional well-being to be put on the line? Why should we stick our neck out at the risk of upsetting other people by telling them the gospel? Why should we do it knowing that we are going to receive abuse many times? If nothing else, uh, people are going to think, of course, we're odd, out of step, religious fanatics, freaks. Why should we stand in the life chain and tell people the truth regarding abortion? Why should we do it? Well, the reason why is because, of course, that's what our Father tells us to do. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ sends us to do. And if we want to love him, that's how we love him. We, we do more than just, of course, gather here and, and give him praise and worship, although that is an expression of love. But we also love him with our lives. We, we submit to what our Lord has called us to do, to be the ambassadors of his gospel. But we also do it because those people who are out there, the very ones who would abuse us, also need to hear the gospel. Uh, this is the only way that they can be saved from what the Bible says very clearly is going to happen to them if they do not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And people don't like to hear it today. It's one of the things that will be ridiculed for, but the Bible does say they will go down to an eternity of agony in hell for their sins. Now, I believe love should dictate to us that even the salvation of even one soul is worth whatever inconvenience we would have to endure or whatever abuse we would have to endure in order to get the gospel out to them. I'm reminded of what uh, Charles Spurgeon said on that one occasion where he talked about a um, hypothetical situation. What if there was one person in Siberia whom we know, if each of us went to him and shared the gospel with him, by the time all of us had gone through that process, that person would be saved. He would come to Christ. He said, how many of us would not go knowing that person could be saved? Sometimes you might think it's impossible for people to be saved. And when we look at it at a, at a, on a human level, we say, yes, it is, because it seems like people are so antagonistic toward the gospel. But remember, the Spirit of God works through the gospel. He will save. We just have to get the message out. We need to sow the seed, which is what we're going to be looking at this evening. But I want you to notice, secondly, that Jesus didn't just merely uh, grin and bear this abuse. And he didn't cower, on the other hand, and sort of skulk away. He continued to defend what he was saying, knowing that their souls were on the line, and he warned them of what would happen if they did not listen to him in verses 49 and 50. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Notice, it looks like Jesus passes by the first insult, that he is a Samaritan, unless, of course, the Jews wrap those two ideas together. And he defends himself against the second, that he had a demon. The consequences of a racial slur 
And the remark could have been nothing more than that is really nothing compared to the consequences that would be theirs if they continued to think that he was enslaved by Satan or that he had lost his mind. I do not have a demon, Jesus says. Far from being some kind of a crazed, demon-possessed man, I, Jesus says, am honoring my Father. That is why he sent me out, to preach the truth so that you could be saved. I, I think it goes without saying that sin has the tendency to put the worst spin on the actions of others, which is what they're doing here with regard to Jesus. Jesus is trying to, to minister the gospel to them. He's trying to you know, save them. And they're basically saying, you're this half-crazed Samaritan demon-possessed man. Now, be prepared as you stand in the uh, life chain today or as you go out to share the gospel with others that there will be those who will do the same thing to you. Also, be careful not to take any of these insults personally. I mean, Jesus didn't do that. He said, I'm, I'm simply doing what my Father has sent me to do. I'm, I'm trying to honor Him. And the same thing is true of you. You're, when you go out there to share the gospel, you're basically representing the Lord. Uh, it wasn't your idea to go do this. Jesus commissioned you. Jesus sent you to tell others about Him. You represent Him. And that means, of course, if they happen to get upset about it, they're also going to have to answer to him because he's the commissioner. Now that's really what Jesus points out next is that he was not only seeking to honor, or he was only seeking to honor his father. He wasn't seeking his own glory in what he was doing. And when they dishonored him, they were dishonoring his father. And Jesus says, the father is the one who will require it from your hands. Now, there is a sense in which that is a threat, but it's a well-meant threat. Jesus said that for their salvation. They need to know how things work. You turn away from me, you don't listen to me, then you are going to have to answer to the one who judges. And ultimately, that will be the Lord Jesus Christ. After he ascends, he has given that prerogative to be the judge of all mankind on that final day. Now, Jesus is basically saying this, that he didn't have to seek for his own glory. That's not what he was doing. The Father was going to take care of that because he was seeking the Father's glory. Jesus also said he didn't need to concern himself with judging them for their response because the Father was also going to take care of that. Now, again, the same will be true for you. When you reach out, as the Lord calls you to reach out in the name of Jesus and you do it because you love him and because you love your neighbor and you want his salvation. Uh, you're not doing that because you're seeking your own honor. As a matter of fact, when you go out there, you're not going to receive a lot of honor except perhaps from other Christians who happen to appreciate what you're doing. Uh, if you stand out on the life chain today, there may be some people that drive by that applaud you. you know, they're going to honor you for what you're doing because you're making a sacrifice to honor him. And we always like that, don't we? We always like it when people applaud us. But some other people may go by with less than friendly gestures. And they may uh, curse at you. And I've seen that happen on a number of occasions, some pretty severe things. Even people getting down to fists, of course, which as far as Christians are concerned, we should never retaliate. But there are going to be people out there who hate you for it. But even if they do, remember the Father is going to honor you for all that you do for him. He will seek your honor if you seek his. The Lord Jesus Christ will honor you if you seek to honor him. And let's not forget too that even though they may injure you, the Father is also, if they don't repent and turn to Jesus, he is going to call them into judgment, not only for those sins, but for every single sin that they have ever committed. Now, thirdly, I want you to notice that, again, even after the insults, Jesus doesn't give up. He doesn't throw his hands in the air and walk away. And he realizes that just because they weren't saved now, and we do want to remember these Jews definitely were not saved, even though they were physical offspring of Abraham, even though they were in the Old Covenant Church, 
Jesus says, you're the slaves of sin, you're not the children of Abraham, you were not of God. But just because they were not saved right then did not mean that they could not be saved. The Bible does say there is a line that we can cross over, but they hadn't crossed it yet. They may have accused him of being demon-possessed, crazed out of his mind, a Samaritan and so forth, but they didn't say what the other Jews said in Matthew chapter 12 when they accused him of casting out demons by the prince of demons. They were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Here they're just saying Jesus is a demon-possessed man. There's a difference between those two things. They didn't yet cross over the line. And so Jesus offers them again eternal life. Verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Jesus is saying to them, if you will only listen, if you will only recognize who I am, if you will only receive me, if you will only follow me, you will never die. Now remember, they were on their way to the grave. They were on their way, like all men, to death. They were on their way to judgment. They were on their way to an everlasting torment, I'd say, in hell. It's going to go on forever. But here was a way out. The only way they could get out, the only way that they could go to heaven. And so Jesus persisted. Jesus urged them. Does Jesus love the lost? He does, even those who are, are, you know, visibly, verbally, and even physically abusive. Even after they had crucified him on the cross, he was still praying, the Father, for mercy upon those who did. Now, let me just say, to those of you here this morning who have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, understand Jesus is continuing to offer himself to you. He's continuing to offer you his gospel. He is persisting. He is continuing because of, of his care. Remember, Jesus looked at the rich young ruler who came to him and, and said, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What good thing must I do? Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. And the word he used there, is the strongest word in the Greek for love. And yet, that man turned away and did not follow Jesus. Jesus has a care. Jesus has a concern. Jesus is concerned about you. And he wants you to receive him. And if you will only listen to him, if you will only do what it is he's telling you to do this morning, he will forgive you. He will give you eternal life. He will free you from the sentence that you're under the one you were under when you came into this world, the one that you've only cemented since you've come into the world through your sins. He will save you. He will keep you safe from hell. He will bring you to heaven. And let me just mention to you as well who do know him, realize that this is the message that Jesus is authorizing you to offer to others, to offer them the Lord Jesus Christ in order that they might be saved. John says in John chapter 1, verse 12, where he writes regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Jesus says if you keep his word, if you receive him, if you trust him, if you turn from your sins, you will never see Death doesn't mean you're not going to die physically, but it does mean that you will not experience eternal death and judgment in hell, but you will go to be with him in heaven, and one day your body will be raised and reunited to your soul. Okay, well, Jesus offers the Jews the gospel again. Well, how do they respond to him this time? Have they changed their mind? No, the Jews scoff at him. How can you, Jesus, overcome death? Something even the greatest among us, even the greatest leaders, spiritual leaders in our history have not been able to do. We read in verses uh, 53, I believe it is, and uh, following, well, somewhere in there. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely 
you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Basically, they're saying, Jesus, now we know that you are insane. Abraham is dead. Prophets are dead. And yet you say, if anyone keeps your word, he will never die. Just who do you think you are? And again, Jesus, notice how he responds. He's very careful to explain in a way that shows he's not just trying to promote himself. He's not trying to glorify himself, but he's trying to honor his father. And at the same time, he's continuing to tell them the truth about himself and about them so that they might be saved. We read in verses 54 and 55. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Now when Jesus is telling them that he knows the Father, but they don't know the Father, you know, again, Jesus isn't trying to be cruel. He's not trying to be mean. He's simply pointing out the difference between his relationship with the Father and their relationship with the Father. Jesus says, I know the Father. And not just that I know about him, but I know him in a loving and intimate relationship. And Jesus says, I show my love to the Father by, by doing something that is more than just saying that I know him and saying that I love him. I actually do seek to honor him. I listen to and I obey the word of God. But what about these Jews? Did they know the Father? No, they said they did, but Jesus said they were deceiving themselves. They really didn't know him. These Jews only knew of the Father. They were like Nicodemus, which we saw last Lord's Day evening that where Alistair Begg was dealing with this text regarding Nicodemus. Well, who was Nicodemus? Nicodemus was like these Jews. He was more than these Jews. He was a, a teacher of Israel. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the greatest among the Pharisees. But he was one who professed Judaism, which at the time was the church of God. It was the true religion. Jesus, or excuse me, Nicodemus was a member of that church. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. It's not enough to believe the facts, Nicodemus. It's not enough even to know them well enough to be a teacher of Israel. You've missed the most important thing. You need a new heart. You need the new birth. You need to be changed by the Spirit of God. Well, that's what they needed. They needed that new birth to enable them to know God and to love God in a real and personal relationship. So, Jews, you may say you know him, but you really don't know him. You only know of him. But now with regard to Abraham and the prophets, Jesus says he is greater. He says in verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham, your father, Jesus says, looked forward to my coming, and he saw it and he rejoiced. Now, how did Abraham see Jesus? Well, we know by now how it is he saw him. Jesus didn't actually physically go back in time. He didn't reveal himself to him in some kind of physical form. But Jesus was revealed to Abraham and to the Old Testament saints in a very real way. And those who had faith saw Jesus. Now, Abraham looked forward to his day in a variety of ways, to the sacrifice of Isaac. Remember, Isaac was a type of Jesus, and we know there are many ways in which that was, that was the case. Through the substitution of the ram that the father gave to Abraham in place of his son on Mount Moriah, through the promises that God had made to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed, and in many other ways, God revealed to Abraham the fact that he was sending his son into the world and Abraham believed God. Abraham looked through those promises. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. He trusted him and he received his salvation and he rejoiced. Because 
Now he truly was in a relationship with God. Now his soul was secure. Abraham was justified, Paul tells us, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ the same way that anyone has ever been saved who has been saved. Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Now the Jews still didn't seem to understand what he was saying. They thought that he said that he had seen Abraham, not that Abraham had seen him. The Jews said to him in verse 57, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Again, perhaps turning around what Jesus said to make Jesus look smaller than he was. Because it's one thing for Abraham to see him and rejoice. It's another thing for him to see Abraham. So they turn it around, trying again to demean Jesus. But asking this question, how could you, Jesus, see Abraham? You're not yet 50 years old, and Abraham lived and died 1,800 years earlier. Now what Jesus says in reply tells us why he is greater than Abraham, why he is able to give eternal life. It's because Jesus is eternal. It's because Jesus is God. Jesus said to them in verse 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, we know, from, we've already heard this morning, that when Jesus says I am, he is using the covenant name of God. That's what Yahweh means. It means I am who I am. I mean, literally, I am. He said to Moses on one occasion when he was sending Moses into Egypt to deliver his people out of Egypt. He says, they're going to ask me what your name is. What should I tell them? He says, I am who I am. You shall tell them, I am has sent me to you. Well, that is essentially what the word Yahweh means. It's, it is a form of the Hebrew verb to be, and it means I am. I am the eternally existing one. So Jesus here is, in fact, using the name of God, but he is also saying that I am eternal. How did I see Abraham? How did Abraham see me? I am the eternally existing one. I'm God. Now note, Jesus is not saying that he is the Father, but he is saying that he is eternal with the Father. Uh, John tells us in John, the very first verse of this gospel, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this one, whom he goes on to say, uh, became flesh and dwelt among us, the Word of God, the, the, the one who reveals God, is the one who was eternal with God, in the beginning with God, and he is God himself. You notice how John continues to dwell specifically on those things that Jesus says that reveal his true identity, his true nature, his, his deity in particular. The reason why Jesus can grant immortality, the reason why he can give eternal life is because he is the eternal God. Now finally, we see the Jews' response to Jesus' claim. Is Jesus saying here merely that he existed before Abraham? Is Jesus saying that he was perhaps at the beginning with God during, you know, at the time of the creation, but he didn't exist prior to that, or if he did, it was for a short time? Is he saying that he is God's greatest creation? Is he saying that he's an angel that has been turned into a man for one reason or another that has to do with salvation the way that Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Now, Jesus is saying much more than that. Because of the, ways, the way, I should say, the Jews responded, they would not have responded as they did if Jesus meant anything else than that. We read in verse 59, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Jews already wanted to kill him because he claimed that God was his father. Now he's claiming to be the eternal one. And of course, they saw that as blasphemy. And it would have been blasphemy if Jesus had been merely a man. But it isn't because it is true. Jesus is God and he is man. Now we know that that 
is a part of our redemption. It's a part of our salvation. This is the only person who can save us because he is the only one who has what he needs to save us. As a man, he was able to do what was necessary to reconcile you to God. A man needed to obey the commandments of God, and Jesus became a man to obey them. A man needed to pay the price for the breaking of those commandments, and so Jesus became a man and took your sins upon himself, if you are in fact trusting in Jesus this morning, and he died in your place. But of course, he had to be much more than a man in order to save you, because even a perfect sacrifice of one man would not have been enough to satisfy the wrath of an infinite God against your sins. The one who made the payment had also to be God so that he could pay the price. And he also had to be God in order to grant something that only God can give, and that is eternal life. Basically, Jesus is the only way to immortality, the only way. The Bible does tell us that everyone is going to live forever. Once God brings somebody into existence, once he creates their soul, that soul is indestructible because of God's plan, because of his decree. But the Bible also says that most are going to live, if we can use those, that term, in unimaginable torment forever for their sins. But Jesus here is telling us that he is able to give eternal life. He is able to give freedom from that judgment. He is able to give freedom from that pain. And he is able to give an eternity of a very, very comfortable living situation in heaven. One which is really beyond our comprehension, but we do have a small taste of it through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. But we need to see that he is able to give us even much more than that. He is also able to give us a personal relationship with God, which is even you know, far greater than the comfortable eternal life that we will receive and not suffering, of course, forever in hell. And that is eternal life, that we may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now the question this morning that this text asks you is, do you want this kind of immortality. If you do, Jesus tells you how you can have it in verse 51. Again, he says this, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, going to heaven is not an automatic thing. And as you've already heard on many occasions, it's Going to heaven is not a matter of God balancing the scales, as it were, putting your good works on one side and your bad works on the other and seeing which outweighs the other. Because as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us if God were to do that, all of the works would go on the bad side because nothing we do is actually good. It may be outwardly good. It may benefit other people. But it's not done out of a love for God and a desire for his glory unless you have the Holy Spirit in your heart unless you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if God puts your works in the scales, the bad works go down, you lose, and you end up in hell. So even those people who are trusting in that, they're not going to get what they want. There's only one way that you can be saved, and that is through the good works of our Lord Jesus Christ because his works alone are perfect. And he alone has given a sacrifice that is able to remove all your sins and fully satisfy God's justice. That's why Jesus says, if you will keep his word, what is his word? Well, he says, come to me, repent of your sins, and come to me, trust in me, follow me. If you do that, you will never see death. You will live forever. That is his promise, and that is his offer to you this morning, if you haven't. But if you have already received this life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, that he wants you to offer it to other people. He wants you to offer his life to them through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to offer them real immortality. You know, people today are seeking to be immortal in so many different ways. You know, they've got to make their mark in history, do some 
great accomplishment. Some, sing some uh, great song, become some great actor, some great athlete. Well, you know what? They do make their mark in history. I mean, we still remember those people who lived and died. But you know what? One day this world and all of its works are going to be burned up. And everything that they have done will be forgotten because those kinds of wreaths are perishable. They really don't matter. The only ones that really do matter are the ones that last forever. And those are reserved only in heaven for those who are going to heaven and for those who have served the Lord faithfully here on earth. Uh, the only immortality that matters, of course, is eternal life. That's the most important thing. But secondly... For us, it's going to be the honor that the Lord will bestow upon those who have loved him and faithfully served him in this life by taking his gospel and sharing it with other people. When the Lord honors you for that, that is an honor that you actually will get to keep forever. And even when the world and its works are all burned up, those things will still be remembered throughout time. And those are the kinds of honors that we ought to be seeking for. So by giving this message away, by sharing this good news with other people, even though we may be opening ourselves up to abuse, we know that the Lord will save some who hear us. He will save them. And we also know that we will be honored for our sharing that gospel with others with an honor that we will be able to keep forever. So may the Lord encourage us to give ourselves to doing what it is that he calls us to do, what he's commissioned us to do, what love in our hearts dictates that we do, and that is leading those for whom Jesus laid down his life to saving faith in his name. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us do that.